All right, hey guys, uh, Ridgeway here again for your next uh, walkthrough of our lesson here for world history uh, since 1700. And so this is the first lesson where we're actually gonna get to content, um, which if you're again, more of a fan of the actual learning of the history stuff, this is where we get to start with that. Um, that all being said, um, you know, again, same rules as before. If you have a need to pause this video at any time to, you know, or watch it at double speed or half speed or what needs be, go for it. All right, so uh, our lesson here is the ambitious Atlantic in 1700. Kind of what we're trying to do here is really to set the stage for what is going on in the world. Um, Cause there's a whole wide list of varieties uh, uh, of things um, with how, you know, how do we actually jump into this thing without starting at the beginning is kind of the idea, right? Uh, so uh, first things first, okay? Uh, what we're gonna uh, do here is take a moment to look at something called the Columbian Exchange. And this is something that by the year 1700, this has really come into full force, although you could arguably say that, you know, it's, it's been going on at this point for roughly about 100 years um, once we get to the 1700s. Uh, and that is, um, well, really, eh, 200 years. Um, so with that all being said, um, what is the Columbian Exchange? So this was basically the idea that once Columbus makes his voyages and the hemispheres are now connected to one another, quote unquote, um, how do they actually begin exchanging ideas and goods and things like that? And so they are actively communicating that, you know, things are crossing the Atlantic now. And it's not just necessarily uh, food, although the examples that we're going to look at here are, are some of those. Um, it's more broadly, we refer to them as like food stuffs. So this is kind of a fun um, activity just to kind of get the juices flowing. And all you're going to do here is you're going to click this little yellow square down at the bottom. Uh, you're going to make a copy of this activity. And then uh, from that point on, uh, once it makes a copy, uh, it says sort each product or good onto the hemisphere where it originated. When you think you've got the right answer, check yourself using the next slide. So for example, you can see we have these products up here. There are, I believe, 10 of them. Um, and so your job is to see, like, what do you, what do you think about, uh, do you happen to know where these came from? So for example, like, did corn start in the Western hemisphere and then migrate to the Eastern hemisphere? So in that case, you would put it here, like where it originated from, or was it the opposite? It, it traveled this direction, okay? So um, take five minutes, uh, you know, make, make your guesses. Uh, you might happen to know some of them off the top of your head. Uh, if not, don't worry, no big deal. Uh, and then what you're gonna do to check your answers is you're gonna click on slide number two here. And I will not spoil the answers, but um, you, you can check your key um, you know, using, using that slide. Excellent. So uh, once you do that, uh, here's kind of what our, our goals are here for today. Um, so we are going to look at uh, something called the triangular trades and kind of try to understand what those were. And then we're also gonna look at um, how those operated in the context of this thing called mercantilism, okay? Because again, I, I'm trying to really kind of lay out the basis of how the world is kind of functioning um, at this point, at least in terms of the Atlantic, uh, you know, again, in 1700. And then lastly, uh, you'll you'll finish up with um, looking at the impact of Columbus's and Magellan's voyages, which we'll, we'll talk about and how those fit into the larger context of what's happened, um, give or take in the last 200 years. So uh, with that being said, um, all right, the triangular trade and mercantilism. Um, if you're just now joining the video lecture because you uh, saw this link here, um, I'll make sure that I have that time linked for you. Um, so something uh, with that, you'll see down here in the bottom right hand side that I have a notes page. Uh, that is linked. Uh, this is something that you can use. Um, it's something that I've had students use in the past if they have you know, requested like a quick downloadable notes page that they can make use of uh, to type on. Um, you don't have to use it. You can make one that's on paper, totally fine by me. Um, but I do recommend you have some method of taking notes. Now, um, I do you know, digress here in, in saying that um, I have not talked with you guys about how to properly take notes, um, although I am going to be collecting some of them from a reading that you will be doing after um, this class. The main thing that I'll give you a guide on in terms of like what's, what's valuable here is that you'll see that I left some words underlined, and we'll talk about why those particular terms were underlined when we meet for class uh, next time. All right, so with that being said, what is this triangular trade? What does it have to do with mercantilism? Let's go. So uh, kind of the bigger pictures that we're looking at here, uh, or bigger questions that we're looking at here is how do people and countries 
um, you know, how, how do you and, and how do we think about how the global economy works? Uh, we'll get to how that worldview kind of is set up in the 1700s and then kind of looking at this idea at progress coming at the expense of others because that is going to be kind of a running theme that we're going to run into here when we look into the 1700s is that there are some very key thoughts that certain countries and philosophical thinkers have about, you know, how the world quote unquote should operate at this time. Okay, so with that being said, let's talk about the state of the world at this point, okay? Um, and very briefly, I'm going to digress from the notes here just because I want to make sure that, you know, you're kind of understanding where the world is at. So if you were to take a map of the world at 1700, really what you're going to see at this point is there are a large number of what we would call nation states that have started to become constructed. So these are like, for example, if you were to like open up a map today, like you would see, you know, England, France. Um, you're not going to see Germany yet for reasons that we'll get into um, in future classes. But like you're gonna see Spain, right? So like a lot of these like main key European countries that we will later identify um, in, you know, uh, 300 years from now when we get to like, you know, into the modern day, they're there. And they're there because of something called the Treaty of Westphalia, which kind of set up this idea that again, nation states exist. And the whole reason why I bring this up now is because we're like simply put, the idea of a country or a nation state, I'm gonna use that word, you know, just because that's, something that we'll come back to um, in class. This idea that like, that there are these countries that have interests, they make decisions, and you know, in a, in a lot of cases, uh, there are some exceptions to this, but in a lot of cases that those countries are ruled by a very, very powerful central leader, usually king, queen, monarch of some kind. Um, that is the absolute flavor of the day, okay? And so again, that kind of helps set the stage for like what the map, at least in terms of right now, Europe looks like. Okay, at this point, the American colonies are up and running. Um, Spain is running all of its uh, colonies um, down further in South America. France has colonies. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get to um, all that jazz. The, the thing that I want to set for you at this point is really how is the world working in terms of how things are flowing and how, you know, like the, the patterns of life and what's happening there. And so for that, um, not that like starting off with economics is like the sexiest way to start off a, you know, a world history class, but it really does help understand like how the world is quote unquote flowing, okay? So at this point, um, again, because Columbus has made his voyages um, for, you know, I would say for better or worse, but really just worse. Um, and since that has really started churning uh, you know, this idea of the hemispheres with the Columbian exchange talking to one another. Um, we have to take a moment to look at trade and what is happening between Europe and North America, um, because this is really where the economic engine of a lot of what is happening in the 1700s is really starting. Okay. And what this is all guided by at this time, all these, you know, you know the country has colonies somewhere else where other, sometimes in other cases, there are people live there in other cases, not. Um, you know, that, that we're having goods go back and forth across the Atlantic. There is a reason behind all this, and that is something called mercantilism, okay? You'll sometimes hear some people call it mercantilism, merc, you know, it has, whatever, mercantilism, mercantilism, same thing. The, what you need to in, like, kind of understand here from the larger picture is that, again, if we're thinking about these big nation states, France, Spain, England, you know, the Dutch to an extent, uh, Belgium, other ones, um, is that at this time, what they really prioritize as a country is this idea of that power, that a power of a country is linked to how much wealth that that country has, and especially hard currency. So like gold and silver. Um, so like this is why, so like for example, like if you Google like the history of Spain and silver mining in, in, in Latin America, you'll just come across just hundreds of awful tales about what the Spanish did in South and Central America. Um, there is this, this absolute obsession with gold, silver, other things of hard material value. Um, again, if you've heard maybe like the three G's like God, gold, glory, you're kind of, you know, getting, getting the right track here. This idea though of mercantilism, what is it all about? Basically says again that a country's power is tied to how much hard currency or wealth that it has. So how do you do that? Well, um, again, you know, think of it like a board game, right? Or a game like in your mind. 
The way that you do that is you simply, again, if you think about it like a business or like a board game, you are maintaining positive trade. You are selling more than you're buying. So you are taking in more hard currency than you're purchasing in return. Okay, and the idea is that you're going to use your colonies as a European country at this time to benefit you and to systematically exploit them and or the people that they rule over in order to benefit you, okay? Um, and this is done in a whole bunch of different ways depending on the countries that you look at. Um, but th this idea that, you know, again, the, the colonies exist to provide for the mother country that is back home is definitely a part, a key, key part of that. Um, now, how do they actually do this? Um, well, basically it's like an early version of capitalism. Like uh, you might like assume today with like, you know, buying and selling, you know, um, you know, supply and demand, like things that you might've heard of, you know, when, when people talk about the economy today, it's a very, very early version of that. And we, uh, it's, it, mercantilism uses this um, version of it that we call state sponsored capitalism. So it's this idea that the state, the, and usually most cases, the monarch or people on behalf of the monarch are very heavily invested, um, literally, quite literally invested in some of the efforts that some of these colonies are doing. So for example, like in uh, Britain, they have the East India Company, which is basically owned by the crown. Um, and they are the ones who are carrying out a lot of the trade that is done in East India with things like tea and uh, other, you know, similar um, goods that they will um, exploit from their colonies. Okay. Um, and this is done uh, all over. So again, like the idea that this, the, again, it's, it's not like just it's a bunch of like rogue business people out there making colonies. No, like these countries are heavily, heavily invested in making these um, state-sponsored companies work. Okay, so again, that, 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 that tie between business and, and, um, and government at this time is really, really high. Um, okay, so what other rules are there? Um, so for colonies, um, again, because they exist to, you know, benefit the home or the mother country, a lot of their trade um, is very, very heavily regulated uh, by that particular country. So like, you know, the example, like uh, if you've heard of like the American Revolution that, um, you know, British colonists, as they were known at that time, they, you know, would very commonly smuggle goods to other countries because they would simply get a better uh, deal for them. That was uh, super illegal. Um, you know, the, again, there's just a lot of restrictions that, the, that are put on these colonies. Um, the colonies, uh, as I mentioned before, they exist to provide raw materials for their home countries, and thus they're kind of relatively exploited over the long run, although there are certainly colonists who go to these places and then in turn exploit other people so they can kind of get themselves ahead. Um, what kind of happens from that point then is that this, the home countries take those raw materials, let's say for example, um, it's sugarcane from uh, the West Indies, uh, you know, places like Cuba or, um, you know, Hispaniola or wherever, they will take that sugar cane, they'll take it back to Britain, uh, refine it, turn it into, um, you know, either molasses there or alcohol there, or they might even do some of that processing back in the West Indies and then take that molasses, uh, you know, for example, back to Britain, turn it into alcohol, and then all of a sudden, then you have, you have a profit. Um, again, all the while, again, the whole theme of this is that a home country is benefiting from collecting, you know, from, from the sale of these manufactured goods that they're benefiting out of this. And that is a really, really key idea. So um, I have a really fun metaphor for you here that you can check out. Um, and I will make sure that this is linked over here on the side. Um, I need to make sure I drop the link in there for you guys so it's, it's there. Um, but there is a cool metaphor using SpongeBob SquarePants that one of my students at one time came up with for this. So you can check that out and then tell me uh, why it works as an effective metaphor um, for mercantilism. Excellent. Uh, and again, you'll type that in on Pear Deck. So make sure you're logged into Pear Deck back here on slide number uh, one by clicking this pair uh, if, if you are not. Okay, so that then gets us to, okay, so if the countries, if this, at this time, the world is all about the trade that is happening between these relative countries. What are they actually trading? And that's what we're gonna look at here. So I've got a digital map for you and I would like you to actually, um, again, this is on slide number 10, this yellow button. I'd like you to actually go ahead and take a first attempt at it yourself to think, you know, okay, 
he mentioned a couple of things, but maybe you already know something about the triangular trade. Uh, what do I think it, you know, it is? Um, and so I've right here, it says triangular trade map template. Okay, you just make a copy of it. And then I'd like you to go ahead and just make a guess uh, what is being traded between them. So I can take these yellow arrows that are here, okay? And I'm gonna set up a triangular trade. Again, I'm not gonna tell you which you know relative areas are going between one another. Um, and then you can put the name of the goods in here if you want to, that's just a quick, easy way to do it. If you wanna put pictures inside, that's fine too. Um, and to make more room for yourself, you can also delete uh, that, that gif there of the instructions. And um, I'm gonna try to draw what I think is, uh, you know, the actual triangular trade. Um, now, uh, you'll notice here you don't have three arrows. How you simply solve that is you just take one, copy it, and then just paste a new one onto the screen, okay? Um, so take, take a stab at it, see if you can create the first triangular trade. So you'll wanna pause the video here, and then we'll come back to it, okay? All right, so assuming at this point you've already made your first guess, um, now we're actually going to go ahead and correct your arrows and look at some of the products that were sent on the probably the most known triangular trade route. There are actually many, many different ones. We're gonna take a look at kind of a couple of key ones. We're not gonna to try to do every single one here. Um, so what do we have? Uh, we have, again, this is your very basic triangle here, right? So the first one, agricultural products. We also sometimes call this foodstuffs. Okay, again, as I mentioned earlier, rice, tobacco, timber, molasses, and sugar. Okay, those were kind of your main ones. So these are all the raw materials that are getting sent back to these relative, broadly speaking, home countries. Now down here, you'll see manufactured products. Okay, now what does that mean? Uh, you know, well, why is it going to Africa? Well, there's a couple of things that are happening here, and uh, we'll talk about this more next class when we look at the, uh, the African slave trade. But there, basically there's a cycle here that is happening, a smaller one, where guns are in exchange for slaves, money is taken from that, used to purchase these things, uh, these foodstuffs for those particular manufacturers, and then that is used then to acquire more guns, which are then sold back to Africa, which then they acquire more slaves, and the cycle just continues to repeat, okay? Uh, now you already heard me mention here um, I guess the other thing we could say besides gun would be rum also was very commonly sold to Africa as well. Um, besides that, uh, that brings us then to, okay, so uh, what about this era right here? That is the start of the African slave trade. Now, technically the Portuguese will get this started before, <coughs> excuse me, other countries become much better known for really taking it to its uh, zenith. Um, but this isn't, we're going to dedicate an entire class to talking about what is happening here, okay? But just please, please understand at its most key fundamental level, mercantilism and the triangular trade and really the richness of Europe for the next, mm, I mean, really from 1500 all the way to 1800 is going to be basically built upon the backs of African slave labor in one way, shape, or form. Um, so again, just thinking about that for context. Uh, okay, so that is uh, the first triangle that I'd like you to have on your map, okay? Uh, now, this one then is one I'd like you to add this link. The next one is I'd like you to add a few more. Okay, and this actually helps kind of spell out then some more big picture things that are happening, okay? So you can better kind of see that there's not just one triangle, there's actually kind of a couple of key ones. So again, um, for example, notice manufactured goods being sold back to the colony. All right, that was a key thing that we mentioned was happening in mercantilism. So again, that's, that's kind of the profit, right? Now, if you're a colony, um, and this is something to kind of think about from a, you know, a big picture perspective, um, just remember, a lot of these colonies are what we would consider to be like cash crop economies. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So for example, like the West Indies, where they're growing sugarcane, that's all they're growing is sugarcane, that's it. Um, because again, like Europeans just can't get enough of this stuff, right? Um, so if you're, all you're growing is that, you're going to need to buy like other things that you can't get on hand. So for example, like timber, like if you need like, you know, equipment, right? Like, to, you know, to build stuff. 
So yes, manufactured goods are going this way, but in, in a lot of cases, like as I show you here, like there's colonies down here that need other foodstuffs and products. And so they will sell those, you know, for example, like in North America, um, you know, like timber from there, they will sell that down to the colonies uh, that are that are down here because again, like, you know, there's, you know, islands don't have a ton of wood, right? As, a, as an example, um, you know, fish, other things like that. There, you know, the, the colonies, especially the Northern colonies in the, in the Americas have had a very lucrative um, fishing markets. Um, okay, so from that point then, uh, so what else is happening? So then for, again, uh, while well, they're taking, you know, what they make here, molasses and sugar, and they're, and they're sending it, you know, back to England uh, to be made into alcohol. Um, now, the other thing that's happening here, you'll notice, is that money is then getting sent back. Um, so again, if you're, if you're a colony here, um, you are making some money, but you are, again, you're having to pay for the foodstuffs and products. And how you do that is either through molasses, you know, so you sell some of your molasses and sugar to other colonies that are here. Sometimes that was allowed. Uh, or you pay for it, you know, with, with money that you would get. Um, so again, this kind of helps flesh out kind of the rest of the, you know, flows that are happening here in the global economy and helps you kind of understand, like, it's not just simple, like a simple triangle going round and round. There's other considerations that are going on here, if that makes sense. Excellent. So uh, that brings us to um, an exit ticket. And this is something that uh, in our last lesson, digital lesson, we talked about that when you're learning a piece of material and a piece of content, it's not just about like you interacting meaningfully with the material for the first time. It's also about how you are practicing retrieving that information that you've just learned. And so this is one um, that I very affectionately, um, you know, cause I'm a millennial, uh, the 360 no scope is the idea that like, okay, we just sat here and did a short mini lesson on mercantilism and the triangular trade for about 15 minutes take all that and put it all away without looking back at it, write down everything you can remember in 60 seconds on Pear Deck. And again, I, you must do it on Pear Deck in order for to, to get credit for the lesson. So I really do want you to give this a try, okay, and see what you can remember. Definitely pause the video though so you can give yourself a minute uh, and take a real shot at it. Okay, so that then brings us to the last two things that we're gonna be doing here in this lesson. So I'd like you to take a moment, and um, I'm a big fan of myth busting, so to take a look at uh, Christopher Columbus and who that actually really was, um, because for a lot of students, they come in and they're like, you know, don't really have uh, at least the full conceptual picture of what kind of a scumbag he was and kind of what he was really responsible for. Um, so that's, that is there, and I'd like you to click that uh, picture to watch that. And then for Magellan, um, who is a little bit less known, but also really significant for a couple of different reasons, um, Magellan is really useful for understanding um, something called the Treaty of Tordesillas, which is this big dividing line that is cut between the globe um, by, of all people, the Pope. Um, because again, we're, we're in the 1700s and the Pope still has, uh, even, well, this, this, this particular uh, treaty happened before then. Um, because the Pope apparently had a big voice in uh, who got to colonize where. And so Magellan helps us kind of tease out um, why Portugal and Spain were two of the earliest countries uh, to kind of help decide, uh, I guess, how some of the things in, in the world flowed in terms of European exploration. So when you're done um, with those, I'd like you to summarize on Pear Deck three things that seem important about each explorer or their trips um, for a total of six points. Okay. All right. And then the last thing is a here is I've just put a slide that reminds you, and I will attempt to get this accurately on the screen. Um, there we go. Uh, of what is all due for you um, here as we come to our next in-person class. So a study schedule, um, printed and brought to class, completion of uh, the two digital lessons. This counts as one of those. Um, watching how to survive the studying in college part two and then reading pages 500 to 519 in your textbook. This is the, a new assignment that I'd like you to do um, before our class. And I'd like just to see, I would just like to see your notes digitally or a picture of them and how you're taking notes because I need to see what I'm working with um, for you guys in terms of note taking so that we can kind of have a larger discussion uh, about effective note taking practices, not just for this course, but again, like, you know, just good success in college generally. Um, so with that, I know that was quite a bit of information, um, but again, uh, hopefully, you know, nothing in here too, too radical or crazy in terms of content, and again, reach out if you need any assistance. All right, so thanks so much, guys.
See you later.